Diga Nikaya Sutta number 28 Sampasadaniya Sutta Inspiring Serene Faith Thus have I heard. At one time the Blessed Lord was staying at Nalanda in Pavarika's mango grove. Then the Venerable Sariputta came to see the Blessed One saluted him and sat down to one side and said it is clear to me venerable sir that there never has been never will be and is not now another recluse or brahmin who is better or more awakened than the lord you have spoken boldly with a bull's voice sariputta you have roared the lion's roar of certainty how is this have all the arahant buddhas of the past appeared to you and were the minds of all those lords open to you so as to say these blessed lords were of such virtue such was their teaching such their wisdom such their way such their liberation no venerable sir and have you perceived all the arahant buddhas who will appear in the future no venerable sir well then sariputta you know me as the arahant buddha and do you know the blessed lord is of such virtue such his teaching such his wisdom such his way such his liberation no venerable sir so sariputta you do not have knowledge of the minds of the buddhas of the past the future or the present then sariputta have you not spoken boldly with a bull's voice and roared the lion's roar of certainty with your declaration blessed lord the minds of the arahant buddhas of the past future and present are not open to me but i know the drift of the dhamma lord it is as if there were a royal frontier city with mighty bastions and a mighty encircling wall in which was a single gate at which was a gatekeeper wise skilled and clever who kept out strangers and let in those he knew he constantly patrolling and following along a path might not see the joints and clefts in the bastion even such as a cat might creep through but whatever larger creatures entered or left the city must all go through this very gate it seems to me venerable sir that the drift of the dhamma is the same all those arahant buddhas of the past attain to supreme awakening by abandoning the five hindrances defilements of the mind which weaken understanding having firmly established the four foundations of mindfulness in their minds and realized the seven factors of awakening as they actually are all the arahant buddhas of the future will do likewise and you blessed lord who are now the arahant fully awakened buddha have done the same so i came once to the blessed lord to listen to the dhamma the blessed one taught me dhamma most excellently and perfectly contrasting the dark with the light as he did so i gained insight into that dhamma and from among the various things i established one in particular which was serene confidence in the teacher that the blessed one is a fully awakened buddha that the dhamma is well taught by the blessed lord and that the order of bhikkhus is well trained also venerable sir the blessed one's way of teaching dhamma in regards to the wholesome factors is unsurpassed that is to say the four foundations of mindfulness the four right efforts the four spiritual powers the five spiritual faculties the five mental powers the seven factors of awakening 
the Noble Eightfold Path. By these, a bhikkhu, through the destruction of the contaminants, can, in this very life, by his own direct knowledge, realize and attain the taintless liberation of mind and liberation by wisdom, and abide therein. This is the unsurpassed teaching in regards to the wholesome factors. This the Blessed Lord fully comprehends, and beyond it lies nothing further to be comprehended. And in such understanding there is no other recluse or Brahmin who is greater or more awakened than the Blessed Lord, as regards the wholesome factors. Also unsurpassed is the Blessed One's way of teaching the Dhamma in regard to the elucidation of the sense spheres. Thus, there are the six internal and external sense spaces, the eye and visible objects, the ear and sounds, the nose and smells, the tongue and tastes, the body and tangibles, the mind and mind objects. This is the unsurpassed teaching in regard to the sense spheres. This the Blessed One fully comprehends, and beyond it lies nothing further to be comprehended. And in such understanding there is no other recluse or Brahmin who is greater or more awakened than the Blessed Lord. As regards to the sense spheres. Also unsurpassed is the Blessed One's way of teaching Dhamma in regard to the modes of rebirth in four ways. Thus, one descends into the mother's womb unknowing, stays there unknowing, and leaves it unknowing. That is the first way. Or one enters the womb knowing, stays there unknowing, and leaves it unknowing. That is the second way. Or one enters the womb knowing, stays there knowing, and leaves it unknowing. That is the third way. Or one enters the womb while knowing, stays there knowing, and leaves it knowing. That is the fourth way. This is the unsurpassed teaching in regard to the modes of rebirth. This the Blessed One fully comprehends, and beyond it lies nothing further to be comprehended. And in such understanding there is no other recluse or Brahmin who is greater or more awakened than the Blessed Lord, as regards the rebirth. Also unsurpassed is the Blessed One's way of teaching the Dhamma in regards to knowing the thoughts and minds of others in four ways. Thus, one tells by a visible sign, saying, This is what you think. This is in your mind. Your thought is like this. And however much one declares, it is so and not otherwise. That is the first way. Or one tells not by a visible sign, but through hearing a sound made by humans, non-humans, or devas, saying, This is what you think. This is in your mind. Your thought is like this, and however much one declares, it is so and not otherwise. This is the second way. Or one tells not by a sound uttered, but by applying one's mind and attending to something conveyed by sound, saying, This is what you think. This is in your mind. Your thought is like this. And however much one declares, it is so, and not otherwise. That is the third way. Or one tells, not by any of these means, when one has attained a state of mental concentration without thinking and pondering, by predicting another's thoughts in one's mind, and one says, As far as so-and-so's mind force is directed, so his thoughts will turn to that thing. And however much one declares it is so and not otherwise, that is the fourth way. This is the unsurpassed teaching in regard to the knowing of thoughts and the minds of others in four ways. 
This the Blessed One fully comprehends, and beyond it lies nothing further to be comprehended. And in such understanding there is no other recluse or Brahmin who is greater or more awakened than the Blessed One, as regards to the knowing of others' thoughts and minds. Also unsurpassed is the Blessed One's way of teaching the Dhamma in regard to the attainment of vision in four ways. Here, some recluse or Brahmin, by means of ardor, endeavor, heedfulness, application, and wise attention, reaches such a level of collectedness of mind that he reviews just this body, upwards from the soles of the feet and downwards from the crown of the head, enclosed by the skin and full of manifold impurities. In this body there are head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, pleura, spleen, lungs, mesentery, bowels, stomach, excrement, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, tallow, saliva, snot, synovial fluid, urine. That is the first attainment of vision. Again, having done this and gone further, he contemplates the bones covered with skin, flesh and blood. This is the second attainment. Again, having done this and gone further, he comes to know the unbroken stream of human consciousness as established both in this world and in the next. That is the third attainment. Again, having done this and gone still further, he comes to know the unbroken stream of human consciousness that is not established either in this world or in the next. That is the fourth attainment of vision. This is the unsurpassed teaching in regard to the attainments of vision. This the Blessed One fully comprehends, and beyond it lies nothing further to be comprehended. And in such understanding there is no other recluse or Brahmin who is greater or more awakened than the Blessed One, as regards the attainments of vision. Also unsurpassed is the Blessed One's way of teaching the Dhamma in regard to the designation of individuals. There are these seven types. The one liberated in both ways the one liberated through wisdom, the body witness, the view attainer, the one liberated through faith, the truth follower, the faith follower. This is the unsurpassed teaching in regard to the designation of individuals. This the Blessed One fully comprehends, and beyond it lies nothing further to be comprehended and in such understanding there is no other recluse or Brahmin who is greater or more awakened than the Blessed One, as regards to the designation of individuals. Also unsurpassed is the Blessed One's way of teaching the Dhamma in regard to the exertions. There are these seven factors of awakening, mindfulness, investigation of states, energy, joy, tranquility, collectedness of mind, and equanimity. This is the unsurpassed teaching in regard to the exertions. This the Blessed One fully comprehends, and beyond it lies nothing further to be comprehended, and in such understanding there is no other recluse or Brahmin who is greater or more awakened than the Blessed One, as regards to the exertions. Also unsurpassed is the Blessed One's way of teaching the Dhamma in regard to the modes of progress, which are four. Painful progress with slow comprehension, painful progress with quick comprehension, pleasant progress with slow comprehension, pleasant progress with quick comprehension. In the case of painful progress with slow comprehension, 
Progress is considered poor on account of both painfulness and slowness. In the case of painful progress with quick comprehension, progress is considered poor on account of painfulness. In the case of pleasant progress with slow comprehension, progress is considered poor on account of slowness. In the case of pleasant progress with quick comprehension, progress is considered excellent on account of both pleasantness and quick comprehension. This is the unsurpassed teaching in regard to the modes of progress. This the Blessed One fully comprehends, and beyond it lies nothing further to be comprehended. And in such understanding there is no other recluse or Brahmin who is greater or more awakened than the Blessed One, as regards the modes of progress. Also unsurpassed is the Blessed One's way of teaching the Dhamma in regard to proper conduct in speech. How one should avoid not only any speech involving lying, but also speech that is divisive, nor that which is slanderous, nor that which seeks victory born of anger. This is the unsurpassed teaching in regard to proper conduct in speech. This the Blessed One fully comprehends, and beyond it lies nothing further to be comprehended. And in such understanding there is no other recluse or Brahmin who is greater or more awakened than the Blessed One, as regards the proper conduct in speech. Also unsurpassed is the Blessed Lord's way of teaching the Dhamma in regard to a person's proper ethical conduct. Thus, one is truthful, has faith, not false, not pattering, not hinting for gains, not a cheat, not coveting gain with gain. One is also guarded in one's sense doors, moderate in food, consistent in deeds, devoted to wakefulness, a meditator, mindful, skilled in the good, and of good conduct, resolute, sensible, not greedy for sense pleasures, mindful and prudent. This is the unsurpassed teaching in regard to a person's proper ethical conduct. This the Blessed One fully comprehends, and beyond it lies nothing further to be comprehended, and in such understanding there is no other recluse or Brahmin who is greater or more awakened than the Blessed One, as regard to a person's proper ethical conduct. Also unsurpassed is the Blessed One's way of teaching the Dhamma in regard to the modes of receptivity to instruction, of which there are four. The Blessed One knows by his own wise attention that one will, by following instructions, by the complete destruction of the three fetters, become a stream winner, no more subject to rebirth in the lower worlds, firmly established, destined for full awakening. That one will, by following instructions, and by the complete destruction of the three fetters, and the reduction of greed, hatred, and delusion, become a once-returner, and having returned once more to this world will put an end to suffering. That one will, by following instructions, and by the complete destruction of the five lower fetters, be spontaneously reborn in the pure abodes, and there will reach Nibbana without ever returning from that world. That one will, by following the instructions, and by the destruction of the contaminants, gain in this very life the deliverance of mind, the deliverance through wisdom which is uncontaminated, and which one has understood and realized by one's own direct knowledge. This is the unsurpassed teaching in regard to the modes of receptivity to instruction. This the Blessed One fully comprehends, and beyond it lies nothing further to be comprehended, 
and in such understanding there is no other recluse or Brahmin who is greater or more awakened than the Blessed One. As regards the modes of receptivity to instruction. Also unsurpassed is the Blessed One's way of teaching the Dhamma in regard to the knowledge of the liberation of others. The Blessed One knows by His own wise attention that one will, by the complete destruction of the three fetters, become a stream winner no more subject to rebirth in lower worlds, firmly established, destined for full awakening. That one will, by following instructions, and by the complete destruction of the three fetters, and the reduction of greed, hatred, and delusion, become a once-returner, and having returned once more to this world, will put an end to suffering. That one will, by following the instructions, and by the complete destruction of the five lower fetters, be spontaneously reborn in the pure abodes, and there will reach Nibbana without ever returning from that world. And that one will, by following the instructions, and by the destruction of the contaminants, gain in this very life the deliverance of mind, the deliverance through wisdom which is uncontaminated, and which one has understood and realized by one's own direct knowledge. This is the unsurpassed teaching in regard to the knowledge of the liberation of others. This the Blessed One fully comprehends, and beyond it lies nothing further to be comprehended. And in such understanding there is no other recluse or Brahmin who is greater or more awakened than the Blessed One, as regards to the knowledge of the liberation of others. Also unsurpassed is the Blessed One's way of teaching the Dhamma in regard to the doctrine of eternalism. There are three such theories. Here, some recluse or Brahmin, by means of ardor, effort, devotion, heedfulness, and by means of wise attention, and through collectedness of his mind, he recollects his manifold past lives, that is, one birth, two births, three, four, five births, ten births, twenty births, thirty births, forty births, fifty births, a hundred births, a thousand births, a hundred thousand births. Thus he sees, there I was so named, of such a clan, with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my life span, and passing away from there I reappeared elsewhere, and there too I was so named, of such a clan, with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my lifespan, and passing away from there I reappeared here. Thus with their aspects and particulars he recollects his manifold past lives. And he says, I know the past, whether the universe was expanding or contracting, but I do not know the future whether it will expand or contract. The self and the world are eternal, barren, steady as a mountain peak, rooted like a pillar. Beings run on it, transmigrate, passing away and reappear, yet these persist internally. Again, some recluse or Brahmin, through ardor, and by means of effort, devotion, heedfulness, and wise attention, recollects through collectedness of mind his manifold past lives, that is, one birth, two births, three, four, five births, ten births, twenty births, thirty births, forty births, fifty births, a hundred births, a thousand births, 
a hundred thousand births, one world contraction and expansion, or two world contraction and expansion, or three world contractions and expansions, or four world contractions and expansions, or five world contractions and expansions, or ten world contractions and expansions, or twenty world contractions and expansions. Thus he sees, there I was so named, of such a clan, with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my lifespan, and passing away from there I reappeared elsewhere, and there too I was so named, of such a clan, with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my lifespan, and passing away from there I reappeared here. Thus, with their aspects and particulars, he recollects his manifold past lives. He then says thus, I know the past, when the world expanded or when it contracted, and I know the future as well, when the world will expand again or when it will contract again. The self and the world are eternal, barren, steadfast as a mountain peak, standing firm like a pillar. Beings run on it, they transmigrate, pass away and reappear, yet these persist eternally. Again, some recluse or Brahmin recalls his manifold past lives, that is, one birth, two births, three, four, five births, ten births, twenty births, thirty births, forty births, fifty births, a hundred births, a thousand births, a hundred thousand births, many eons of world contraction, many eons of world expansion, many eons of world contraction and expansion. There I was so named of such a clan, with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my lifespan, and passing away from there I reappeared elsewhere, and there too I was so named, of such a clan, with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my lifespan, and passing away from there I reappeared here. Thus, with their aspects and particulars, he recollects his manifold past lives. Then he says thus, I know the past, when the world expanded, or when it contracted, and I know the future as well, when the world will expand, or when it will contract. The self and the world are eternal, barren, steadfast as a mountain peak, rooted like a pillar. Beings run on it, they transmigrate, pass away and reappear, yet these persist eternally. This is the unsurpassed teaching in regard to the doctrine of eternalism. This the Blessed One fully comprehends, and beyond it lies nothing further to be comprehended. And in such understanding there is no other recluse or Brahmin who is greater or more awakened than the Blessed One, as regard to the doctrine of eternalism. Also unsurpassed is the Blessed One's way of teaching the Dhamma in regard to past lives. Here, some recluse or Brahmin recollects his manifold past lives, that is, one birth, two births, three, four, five, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, a hundred, a thousand, a hundred thousand births, many eons of world contraction, many eons of world expansion, many eons of world contraction and expansion. There I was so named, of such a clan, with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, 
such my lifespan, and passing away from there I reappeared elsewhere. And there too I was so named, of such a clan, with such an appearance. Such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my lifespan, and passing away from there I reappeared here. Thus, with their aspects and particulars, he recollects his manifold past lives. He also knows that there are devas, whose lifespan is not to be reckoned by counting or computation. Yet whatever existence they have previously experienced, whether in the world of form or in the formless world, whether conscious, unconscious, or neither conscious nor unconscious, they remember the details of those past lives. This is the unsurpassed teaching in regard to remembrance of past lives. This the Blessed One fully comprehends, and beyond it lies nothing further to be comprehended. And in such understanding there is no other recluse or Brahmin who is greater or more awakened than the Blessed One, as regards to the remembrance of past lives. Also unsurpassed is the Blessed One's way of teaching the Dhamma in regard to knowledge of the death and rebirth of beings. By means of ardor, effort, devotion, heedfulness, and wise attention, directs his collected mind, which is purified and bright, to the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. Thus, with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. He understands how beings pass on according to their actions thus. These worthy beings who were ill-conducted in body, speech and mind, revilers of noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong view in their actions, on the dissolution of the body, after death, have reappeared in a state of deprivation, in a bad destination, in perdition, even in hell. But these worthy beings who were well conducted in body, speech, and mind, not revilers of noble ones, right in their views, giving effect to right view in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in a good destination, even in the heavenly world. Thus, with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, and he understands how beings pass on according to their actions. This is the unsurpassed teaching in regard to knowledge of the death and birth of beings. This the Blessed One fully comprehends, and beyond it lies nothing further to be comprehended. And in such understanding there is no other recluse or Brahmin who is greater or more awakened than the Blessed One, as regard to the passing away and reappearance of beings. Also unsurpassed is the Blessed One's way of teaching the Dhamma in regard to the supernormal powers. These are of two kinds. There is the psychic power that is with contaminants and with attachment, which is called ignoble, and there is the kind of psychic power that is free from the contaminants and not bound with attachment, which is called noble. What is the ignoble psychic power? Here, some recluse or Brahmin enjoys various supernormal powers. Being one, he becomes many. Being many, he becomes one. He appears and disappears. He passes through fences, walls, and mountains, unhindered as if through air. He sinks into the ground and emerges from it as if it were water. He walks on the water without breaking the surface as if on land. He flies cross-legged through the sky like a bird with wings. 
He even touches and strokes with his hand the sun and moon, mighty and powerful as they are, and he travels in the body as far as the Brahma world. That is the ignoble psychic power. And what is the noble, supernormal psychic power? Here a bhikkhu, if he wishes, let me dwell perceiving the unrepulsive in the repulsive. Thus he dwells perceiving the unrepulsive. If he wishes, let me dwell perceiving the repulsive in the unrepulsive. He dwells perceiving the repulsive. If a bhikkhu wishes, let me dwell perceiving the unrepulsive in the repulsive and in the unrepulsive. He dwells perceiving the unrepulsive. If a bhikkhu wishes, let me dwell perceiving the repulsive in the unrepulsive and in the repulsive. He dwells perceiving the repulsive. If a bhikkhu wishes, let me, rejecting both the repulsive and the unrepulsive, dwell equanimous, mindful and fully aware. He dwells equanimous, mindful and fully aware. This is the noble psychic power that is free of the contaminants and not bound with attachments. This is the unsurpassed teaching in regard to the supernormal psychic powers. This the Blessed Lord fully comprehends, and beyond it lies nothing further to be comprehended. And in such understanding there is no other recluse or Brahmin who is greater or more awakened than the Blessed Lord as regards the supernormal powers. Whatever, Blessed Lord, it is possible for a clansman endowed with confidence and faith to achieve by putting forth effort and by persistence, by human effort, human exertion and human endurance, that the Blessed Lord has achieved. For the Blessed One gives himself up neither to the pleasures of the senses, which are inferior, vulgar, for worldlings and not for the noble, and unbeneficial, nor to self-torment, which is painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial. The Blessed One is able, here and now, to enjoy the surpassing happiness of dwelling in the four jhanas. Blessed One, if I were asked, Well now, friend Sariputta, have there ever been in the past any recluses or Brahmins more exalted in awakening than the Blessed One? I should say, no. If asked, will there be any such in the future? I should say, no. If asked, is there any such at present? I should say, no. Again, if I were asked, have there been any such in the past equal in awakening to the Blessed One? I should say, yes. If asked, will there be any such in the future? I should say, yes. But if I were asked, are there any such at present equal in awakening to the Blessed One? I should say, no. And if I were then asked, Venerable Sariputta, why do you accord this highest recognition to one and not the other? I should say, I have heard and received it from the Blessed One's own lips. There have been in the past, and there will be in the future, Arahant Buddhas equal in awakening to myself. I have also heard and received it from the Blessed One's own lips, that it is not possible. It cannot be that in one and the same world system, two Arahant, supremely awakened Buddhas, should arise simultaneously. No such situation can exist. Blessed One, if I were to reply thus to such questions, would I be speaking in conformity with the Blessed Lord's word and not misrepresenting him by departing from the truth? Would I be explaining the Dhamma correctly so that no fellow followers of the Dhamma 
could contest it or find occasion for censure? Certainly, Sariputta. If you answered like this, you would not misrepresent me. You would be explaining the Dhamma correctly and not laying yourself open to censure. At this, the Venerable Udayin said to the Blessed Lord, It is wonderful, Blessed One. It is marvelous how content the Blessed One is, how satisfied and restrained. When being endowed with such power and influence, he does not make a display of himself. If the wanderers professing other doctrines were able to discern in themselves even one of such qualities, they would proclaim it with a banner. It is wonderful, blessed Lord, it is marvelous how content the blessed one is, how satisfied and restrained. When being endowed with such power and influence, he does not make a display of himself. Well then, Udai, just observe, so it is. If such wanderers were able to discern in themselves even one of such qualities, they would proclaim it with a banner. But the Tathagata is content, satisfied and restrained when being endowed with such power and influence, and he does not make a display of himself. Then the Blessed One said to Sariputta, And therefore you, Sariputta, should frequently speak about this matter to bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, to male and female lay followers, and any foolish people who have doubts or queries about the Tathagata will, by listening to such talk, have their doubts and queries resolved. This is how the Venerable Sariputta proclaimed his serene faith in the Blessed Lord, which led to this sutta to be named Inspiring Serene Faith. Signed.